stupid stuff, but they would have gone off the deep end and done stupid stuff with or without drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never looked at the, the drug question and said, oh, that's the bad actor. No, you got to look at the individual behind it, I've always thought. Right. And, and that's in part what, you know, led me down this path of, of entheogens and plant medicines in, in my law practice now. Um, okay, so now you, you did mention a, a moment ago about donating a kidney, and that was a, a great segue from the introduction because you've got a website talking about how social media stole your kidney. So I don't understand that, and I would love for you to explain it. So how did social media steal your kidney? So I am a social media consultant, and I've been a very heavy social media user since MySpace because I was a stand-up comic and a radio DJ. I built my own brand there and went into Twitter. I was on Twitter for a year or two before I ever joined MySpace. And uh, to this day, MySpace is my least favorite. But anyway, I'm on Twitter one night, and I see two people I know talking, and one, the woman in the conversation, she had a mother who was sick with kidney failure. And I was aware of it just because, you know, we followed each other on Twitter. And so I see this conversation that her mom finally agreed to go on the list, the transplant list, and I volunteered. So this was January 2011. Um, she's a little Indian lady. And, well, they've lived here for 50 years, but they're originally from India. They live in Surprise. I donated to her four months later. We were a perfect match. Um, this was definitely a destiny thing because one of the tests that we had was a CT scan and they take the picture of your two kidneys to figure out which one to take because mm. they always leave the best one with the donor. Both my kidneys are fine, but you know, if there's like whatever, um, they figure out which kidney to take. I go in for surgery at the Mayo Clinic in North Scottsdale. The Today Show came out twice to film us too. And they knock me out. They cut me open. They're ready to take my kidney out. And they're like, oh, no, Amy has an extra renal vein that didn't show up on the CT scan. Well, that's a problem because just like plugging something into an outlet, it has to match. Sure. So in order to plug my kidney in, we had to have the same veins and arteries. So they run across the hall to, the, to her surgery room. She's prepped. And they say, hey, we have this potential problem. And they're like, we've just prepped her. And you're never going to believe this. But she has the same vein that didn't show up on her CT scan. Wow. So, yeah, um, they're Hindu. So they're, you know, I've, I've got karma for the rest of my life. Um, and then two years after I donated, I went on a road trip to meet other kidney donors who I met on social media because nobody knew what I went through. A doctor could tell me from a medical journal what to expect, but you know, when it's a pretty heavy thing to do, you're saving a life and it's not easy to really accept that. That's, that's something that for me, it's still not even easy to accept 10 years later almost. Um, so I went on a cross country road trip and that was called social media stole my kidney is the documentary. It's just kind of my kidney brand. I have a website. I've spoken at Ignite Phoenix about it and the trailer is out and we're in post-production. Um, and it turns out that the guy who might be doing the rest of the funding, I met through the cannabis industry. His whole family has polyistic kidney disease. So my, my real goal in this industry is to um, educate transplant centers on cannabis because one of the girls in my film was set to donate to a coworker the night of the sur the night before the surgery they tested him for THC and he tested positive because dialysis is brutal and they took him off the list uh, he did not get a kidney he's probably dead by now wow and it's because of a mold. That's what they say. It's a, a mold. But transplant centers need to understand that one, we have testing now Two, patients grow their own. So they know exactly what's on it. And there's no mold on their stuff. Um, I just feel it's unfair. And for donors like me, we should not have to worry about being cannabis consumers because I can't take ibuprofen. I refuse to take Tylenol. Like, what do I do for my chronic pain? I was a gymnast cheerleader power lifter. Like it, I need that, you know, I don't want to ruin my good kidney. I, I don't have a lot of choices out there, which is why I'm still quarantined. Yeah. Um, 
the first function of your body to be affected by COVID is your kidney function. So I have been, I don't have an immune problem at all. I'm just as healthy as everybody else, but I'm not taking that chance. So yeah, my little tiny mom and I, we talk on the phone all the time. She, she's great. They don't know what I do for a living and that's fine because <laughs> they're from India. It's a little, they're conservative when it comes to that. Yeah. It, and it's funny you say that because, um, in my experience with people from India and I've had tons of people from India in my life over my uh, entire lifetime, in fact, um, they are, t they do tend to be quite conservative, but not when it comes to cannabis. Yeah. Depending on what region yeah. of India you're from. Exactly. They're from way up north. You're like Punjab. They're from, yeah, they are, um, you know, arranged marriage, very traditional. They're very liberal in their thinking, yeah. but, you know, conservative in some things. So yeah. like they're I, very good people. I've heard at, at some a big uh, events like weddings or, or the equivalent it's not uncommon in some regions for them to go cut an entire cannabis bush and throw it into a, a community bonfire at the event just so it sort of fills the space with its uh, delicious aroma. Let's just say that. We need to do that when we're safe to uh, be together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Someone's well, got to have a big, big plant somewhere. Yeah. Well, Prop 207, if uh, it passes, will allow When for... it passes. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm still saying if, never, never, never say, uh, you know, for sure how it's going to end until it's over. We uh, we saw a presidential to. election a few years ago we all thought was going to end one way and woke up the next morning to a shock. So I, I have stopped predicting outcomes. Uh, <laughs> I wait till it actually happens. So I'm going to stick with if it passes, and I hope it does. But if it does, we'll, we'll all have uh, adult home grow rights. Um, so yes, there will be opportunity to take a bush and throw it into a bonfire. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. My neighbors may be, well, a few of my neighbors would definitely be excited. A few would not. Private property. <laughs> In, indeed. Till the smoke runs over the fence, then, then it's a public nuisance. But until then. <laughs> All right. So, um, so you donated a kidney to a total stranger. You're, you're a terrible person. What the hell's wrong I'm with you? I'm awful. What, I'm awful. What are you thinking? And on top of that, you, you do consulting work as, as a career. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, social media, I've been doing it for so long. I pivoted into this industry in 2012 and never looked back. So let, let's, uh, let's, let's turn the conversation then to careers then. Cause part, part of my show is exposing the different facets of psychedelics, but this includes also how people can pursue careers or, or jobs, or if they've got a passion for psychedelics and, and maybe they can't turn it into the way they earn their income, how they can channel that energy positively in, in ways that are actually constructive as opposed to sitting on the sidelines as so many people too often do. So if we can turn to that, uh, let me start off by asking, when did you start to head into plant medicine as your career? That was 2012. I was approached, I speak at Tech Phoenix and all of those type things about social media. And I was approached by a local rolling paper company. It was called Bama J. And it had this cool little caricature of Obama. And it had cool puns like, let's keep America rolling. And, you know, a joint, um, I can't remember what, it was just all these cool puns. And, I learned by doing, I'd been doing social media for a living for a few years already, but there was no blog I could read on how to do cannabis social media or anything. And so I started with that little company. Um, and then I had a, a, a vape company here for a while. And then I got in with the holistic center and I was with them for three and a half years. And in that time we got new social networks for the industry, like mass roots, I think might still be around, but Mass Roots was Instagram for stoners. So I jumped onto that right away. And I am a heavy user. And so that qualifies me more than a lot of people because a lot of 
social media people don't understand Twitter or they don't know how to do Pinterest. I use every single one of them because if I'm going to have my bills paid by somebody, I better know exactly what I'm doing and how I'm supposed to be doing it on each network. Sure. So yeah, I've been doing cannabis social media. I do mostly coaching now, a lot of training on compliance. I spoke at MJ BizCon twice last year on marketing in cannabis. And so I've just been kind of pivoting. I'm a member of Women Empowered in Cannabis, and there's a psilocybin section of that that is growing because a lot of the women are in Oakland and Portland and Denver, mm. where they have decriminalized psilocybin. Yeah. So, yeah, I've reached out to all of I, I work with a lot of PR agencies as like a consultant, the social media consultant for them. And I've just let them know, hey, when you get psilocybin people, let me know, because for me, that is education. And that's when I was with the Holistic Center, I educated people on weed. I didn't post, you know, the specials and prices and get shut down all the time. I wanted to educate people because I need to break the stigma. There's stigma around kidney donations. And I worked really hard to break that stigma. I'm not dead. I don't have to do anything that you don't have to do on a daily basis. And growing up Gen X is say no to drugs, um, explicit lyrics, Tipper Gore. Yep. Like we grew up with all of that. And my sister, who's 22 months younger than me, still has that thought process. And I'm completely opposite. And it's just so weird the alex p keaton you know that side of gen x is still out there oh yeah the, yeah the only way we can i mean i'm still breaking the stigma of cannabis i mentioned cbd to my neighbors who are in a 12-step program they don't even like cbd they got real quiet she's like oh what do you take because i had a nasty headache i'm like oh i just have a cbd tincture and topical and she was like <laughs> Okay. I, I had similar experiences <laughs> with my own mother. Uh, my parents are patients, thankfully. Uh, no, my, my parents are the polar opposite. They are from that generation where all drugs are bad. Don't even talk about them. Definitely don't bring them in the house, and, but don't talk about them. Uh, so it took me a long time to kind of like out myself to my parents about yeah. where my law career is at this moment. Um, they took the news well. Uh, my mom ultimately decided she was proud she had a son who was a lawyer and also proud she, that her lawyer son wrote a book. That, that, that took the sting of, oh my God, you're talking about drugs uh, out of the conversation. And, and then the best irony of all is that for years my mother has had sciatica. And she's done everything up and down Western medicine you can think of from nerve ablation to medication to you name it. Nothing took care of it. I convinced her one day, just try a CBD gummy. Not even THC, just CBD. It's the only thing that helps her now. So I actually got her converted into CBD gummies. So uh, that's the power of an open mind, folks. It really is. I am very thankful to say I have a hippie mom. My stepdad and my mom used to grow in the backyard. But being that I am in recovery, I'm recovered from alcohol. At first, they were afraid that I was going to drink. And I'm like, I don't have a problem with pot. Like I smoked it all through high school, but it was never a problem for me. So I just had to educate them. This is what people use to stop drinking. People use cannabis to stop smoking cigarettes. And they're in Payson. They both have their cards now. They go to Untamed Herbs all the time. And when they see Andrew, they're like, oh, we saw Andrew today. <laughs> they know his name. They think it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Um, they're like, oh, what if we drive to Snowflake? Can we go see the grow for Copper State? I'm like, no, mom. <laughs> what if we tell them that we're your parents? I'm like, the guard doesn't know me, mom. <laughs> that's that's adorable. And you know what? I love the fact that people embrace the fascination with something new with that much enthusiasm. Yeah. Because uh, for me, you know, the, the enthusiasm, it's still there, but not like it was when I first got introduced to all this stuff. You know, it's... Shiny object, puppy, you know, you can't. Well, it's resist. our job now, too. Like, now it's just normal. Yeah. This isn't exciting. It's normal. I have to smoke. You know, I had four podcasts today. And now I got to smoke. Like, that's normal now. Yeah. Yeah. Fun stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, that I was able to convert my mother over this. My father's still a tough sell. 
<laughs> he grew up in, in a one-bedroom apartment in the Bronx with like four siblings and a parent all in one room. So tough upbringing, and, and that's just burned into his ethos. So it's a hard bridge to cross. But And Irish, he's... Irish from, from the Bronx. <laughs> that's a tough one. Mm. Yeah. All right. So fun stuff. Uh, now, taking the, the consultancy work a little further, uh, this is your career now. Would you yes. recommend other people getting into this career? Or is there is there room in the industry for young people coming up if they're looking for a, a place to sort of make a name and, uh, and also put food on the table at the same time? Is there opportunity like that opening or present now? In cannabis, there are so many opportunities that we can't fill all the spaces even higher end, like executive positions. Our industry has really matured over the past two or three years to where people are actually regularly using recruiting firms, like banks to get yeah. and flower hire to get um, employees. I mentor a lot of ladies coming into this industry. And there are a, a few have dropped out because it's this is not a nine to five industry. Mm -mm. It takes patience. I mean, how long have you and I been trying to do this? But it's like, you know, it is, this is the, it is what it is industry. It'll happen when it's going to happen. And a lot of people can't handle that. Even though you go into the shops and everything is go, 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 go. You know, those yeah. bud tenders are running their butts off all day long. Um, there's still this growth going on behind the scenes. We need people with knowledge. We need people who are consultants like me, marketing consultants, accountants, um, lawyers, uh, paralegals. Like this industry is maturing to where more people our age can get into it. The younger people, I feel, will always have opportunities because they don't have the bills that we do and can start in retail. I have not worked the retail side and I've, I've loved, I want to one of these days, maybe just throw it all away and say, give me 12 bucks an hour. I want to be a bud tender. Um, but I, I feel that along that maturity is a professionalism that people need to have. So in can of friends, you'll see a lot of people post, um, Hey, I want to get a job in the industry. Okay. Well, just cause you've been smoking pot for 20 years. What are you bringing to the table? When you bring your resume in, is it an updated resume? Is it following current trends and resumes? Like resume format has changed a lot the past few years. Sure. What are you wearing when you go in there to hand in your application? Are you doing it, it like everywhere else where you say, is there a manager available? Are you acting professional? Because this isn't a bunch of hippies. This is businessmen. I'm on a podcast with a lawyer right now. Like this is it's it is a real deal and it's what's carrying this state and the country right now as we go through this pandemic we're all essential we're making money but a lot of people are being able to be medicated and get through this because of us right now so to anybody out there get on linkedin i will be happy happy to look at anybody's linkedin and give them pointers i will be happy to look at anybody's resume and give them pointers um and overall, you don't need to have just a cannabis resume. I have a cannabis resume, but I have a resume with everything. By the way, my degree is high school Spanish teacher. I meant to tell you that before. That's from SUNY Plattsburgh when we yeah. talked about career pivoting. I actually I knew Spanish that. I should have teacher. mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> and some of my students are in the industry now. And I ran into one of the girls. She's like, Miss Donahue? I'm like, Haley? <laughs> Now we can sesh on Zoom together, you know, like that's pretty cool. Um, so there are opportunities. You just have to really put your best foot forward because for every, even when we talk about retail, every bud tender position gets 400 resumes, maybe, maybe more than that, maybe a little bit less, but how are you going to stand out? You have to stand out by looking professional by acting professional your social media you have to be careful with that um when people come to me when i'm going to be connecting people i look at their social media i look to see what kind of posting they do is it you know a bunch of drama whining calling people out because you're a man behind the screen you're not going to get the job you have to present yourself 
professionally. And thankfully, we got in earlier because my hair was bright pink when I got in this industry. I needed to show who I was and I needed people to not forget who I was. It was still small back then, but I just, I really wanted to, like you said, make a name for myself pretty early. Um, go to all the networking events that you can right now. Uh, there are so many online. And, and if, if you're a female, we've got the women empowered in cannabis. We have monthly networking video sessions. I mean, it's so cool to be in this industry, but it's a lot of work. I'm doing two of these tomorrow on a Saturday. You have to be prepared to pivot, to work 90 hours a week, and just to have patience because we're all patients. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you've just said. Um, it is so, so important for people to present professionally and not just present professionally, actually be professional. Don't just create the veneer and then when the moment arrives, fail. Uh, that's bad for everybody. And, and, and you're so right. You know, for anybody who has the lingering misimpression that this is just Cheech and Chong hour, um, sorry, no, that's long since dead. Uh, this is a real, real industry with real, real professionals. And we're talking big, big dollars. Um, the, the cannabis industry, as limited as it is right now, is nationally a billion-dollar industry if you count up all the states and what they're doing. Um, I just posted an episode of Psychedelic Alex over, I think, Tuesday of this week or Monday of this week. And I just did a little 20-minute vignette hypothecating on what a mushroom industry might produce dollars-wise to try to explain what all the hubbub is about investors looking at mushrooms right now. And even my dumb little spreadsheet that, that I embedded into my little video predicts that a, a tiny, fractional little mushroom industry is going to be a billion-dollar industry. That's a We're talking about mental health now. Oh, and this God. is a mental health issue. You know, mental yeah, health absolutely. is a hot topic right now, especially with COVID in the election. Everybody's all over the place right now. Oh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and without giving too much away as to my political leanings, I think we have somebody who's very prominent in the media on a daily basis who might serve as the poster child for a serious rethink on mental illness and how we approach it in this country. Um, you know, you see this reflected in the conversations about defunding the police, which people are misinterpreting. Yeah, it's to, not the right word to use. Yeah, it, it, let me tell you, that campaign shot itself in the foot so it badly by adopting yep. that phrasing. So for anybody at home who's listening to our show who still doesn't get it, <laughs> defund the police does not mean stop paying cops, fire them all. That is not what it means. What it means is lifting off of the police's shoulders the 48 additional tasks that we've heaped on them over the past two or three decades, things they never did before, never should do now, don't want to do now, and shouldn't do now. And amongst those is things like interventions during mental health crises episodes. A cop with a gun is literally the last person you want making that response call. But our current system is set up that, unfortunately, they're all too often the first person making that response call. And what defund means is take the extra budget you were giving the police to deal with that and give it to an agency better able to apply that money in more productive fashion to give the police a break. This is about helping police, not diminishing them. So I hope that clarifies it for anybody who doesn't understand. But absolutely, yes, we have a mental health crisis in this country. Uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health estimates 20%, one in five of us walking around this country has some sort of anxiety or depression disorder that is diagnosable and therefore treatable. And we're just not good at any of it. We are not good at detecting it. We're not good at addressing it. We're not good at interacting with it. We're not good at treating it. But meanwhile... Here comes historical plant medicines that have a tremendous favorable track record and are really, really good at treating this stuff. And drug. they're cheap. And I they're mean, when you look at prescription meds, when they talk about diabetes medications being $1,500 or some crap like that, when I can buy an eight for, 
I could buy a low end eight for 25 bucks. Yeah. And, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and I've said this often in the show and I will say it again. Mushrooms literally grow in shit, literally grow in shit. There's almost nothing cheaper you can get other than maybe the air you breathe. So in the long run, while yes, I am excited that there is this upcoming mushroom medical industrial something, because at least it'll be available to people. I don't think it's going to be long lived. I think there's maybe a decade of people ramping up and getting accustomed to this, followed by the realization that they don't have to shell out two, three, four hundred dollars a session to go see some therapist downtown. Uh, they're going to be able to grow mushrooms under their bed or in their backyard for free and do this for free. So it's just a function of the secret getting out and no longer being secret, I think. I think so too. It, it's just going to, it's going to be as normal as cracking a PBR in the backyard during football. You yeah. know, it, the edibles, you know, they're going to, they make mushroom edibles now. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to really quickly, cause you talked about defunding the police. Sure. Um, my podcast before this one today was with the last prisoner project. I've mm. been a volunteer for them writing letters to cannabis prisoners since quarantine started. Mm. I grew up five miles from Attica. I've always been an empathizer for prisoners because everybody in my town was a CO and they were just assholes. Like they were racist. They were super judgmental and everything. And I, I know everyone has a story. I just, I don't want to judge that. You know, you did, you got caught, you know? Um, but the last prisoner project is cannabis prisoners. Yeah. And many of them are doing life. One of the guys I write to um, is doing life on a first offense. Wow. A first offense, and he's been in prison since the early 90s. So it's it's just another aspect of the legal system that has to change, along with the restructuring of the police. I wish they had just said restructure or, I don't know. Yeah, budget reallocation is probably, or services reallocation would have been better. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community.